John chapter 13, we're going to be reading verses 31 through 35. If, you'll, if you're able, uh, if you could stand out of respect to reading God's word, we're going to read these uh, few short verses. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples." If ye have love, if ye have love one to another. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. The only Father, Lord, I, I just ask you, Lord, that you would just give me wisdom and uh, Lord, give me the clarity of speech, Lord, to uh, share uh, your word and, and the things that you've laid on my heart today, Lord, with, with our church right here, Lord. And I pray that it be an encouragement to those that are saved, Lord, and Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that has not come to that point where they put their faith completely in you, Lord, Lord, I pray that even this would speak to their hearts, Lord, and that they would put their faith completely in you and trust in you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, when this passage picks up, the Jesus and the disciples are in the upper room the night before Jesus' crucifixion. They have already eaten the Passover, and Judas has just left on his mission of betrayal. Jesus' tone now changes, and he speaks to them softly as his little children, as he prepares them for his soon departure from this world. Like a departing father, To his children, he leaves one last command, a new commandment for them to hold fast to. His new commandment is that ye love one another. In the next few minutes, I want us to consider three important facts about Jesus' new commandment. The new of the commandment, the model of the commandment, and the testimony of the of the commandment. So let's just start with the new of the commandment. My first question when reading this passage is, what is new about this command? Have you ever thought about that? He says it's a new commandment. Jesus earlier said that the that earlier said the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There there is none other commandment greater than these. This is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. So at first, the command seems very similar. This new commandment seems very similar to the two commandments we just read, which the Bible says the whole law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. However, as we look at the commandment, this new commandment, I believe we can see at least two new aspects of the command. A new relationship and a new standard. So let's talk about a new relationship first. In the law, the commands are made to the individual and the nation. We can see this in Mark chapter 12 where it says, Hear, O Israel, and then thou shalt. And you know the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not. Okay? Israel being the nation, and thou, which means It's the second person, singular. It it means that it's applying to what? The individual. 
So the relationship in the commands, the two commandments that Jesus gave, the first and the second, are the nation of Israel and the individual responsibility of the person to obey these commands. In other words, it's an individual effort and it's a national effort. In the new commandment, there is a change in the relationships mentioned in the command. First, the command is not given to a nation. It is given to the believers. That's us right here. It's given to us. Second, it is a relationship and a responsibility given to the group. We know this because the word is what? Ye. Think about that for a second. You say, how much can a little word make a difference between thou and thee? Thou is second person singular. Ye is second person plural. Therefore, this new commandment sets up a new relationship based not on position, species, race, religion, nationality, or ethnicity, but on a common faith in Jesus and a common love for each other. That's the new relationship. Now I want to look at the new, a new standard because I said there was two differences. There's a new relationship and there's also a new standard. The standard of the law is the perfect holiness of God. The new new standard of the new command is the love of God and Jesus. Turn with me just a few pages over to John chapter 15 and read with me starting in verse 9. This is during the same discourse, by the way. They haven't left the upper room. They're still in the upper room. But it's some time after. And in John chapter 15, starting in verse 9, it says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. We see that the new standard is the love of God, not the absolute holiness of God, which we could not obtain to. If you think about it, nobody could keep the law. That's what the purpose of the law was, to show us that we are sinners. But the purpose of this new commandment The new standard is what? The love of God. Therefore, we understand that the the new of the commandment is a new relationship in the family of God and a new standard to live by in Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's the new commandment. It's new relationship and it's new standard. Now, I want to talk about the model of the commandment. In science, a model is used to help us understand complex information and to help us apply that information to our lives in the real world. It is easy to say that we love one another, but it's a lot harder to understand what that actually looks like in practice in the real world. In other words, we can say, well, I love, you know, I just love all you guys, okay? But that means nothing, okay? Talk is cheap, right? It is. Talk is cheap. There are many reasons why this is true. Let us consider just a few. The first one is we fail to admit our own sin and self-centeredness. Do you realize that we're selfish, okay? We are. Even at our best day, we are selfish. We always want others, think about this, we always want others to love us. Our focus is is on our needs and our wants, not on Christ and others. And that's the truth. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of you are married in here. And listen, let's just be honest, okay? 
we, we really want our needs to be met, okay? And even a lot of times, the things that we do for each other, unfortunately, because of our sin nature, we still do them to receive, not because we're giving it unconditionally, okay? And so, you know, the reason we fail often is because we just fail to admit we're not honest with ourselves that we have a sin nature and we're self-centered. Another reason why we fail in this is we use others or even ourselves as the standard for love instead of Christ's love. And I know we've talked about this a lot, but you know, it's easy. You know, on Wednesday night, we've been I, I, on Wednesday night we've been studying through Romans. We talked about what the standard is, you know, as far as sin goes. And you know, it's the same thing with love. We tend to want to take, you know, have our own standard instead of taking Christ's example. The third reason we often fail is we do not fully appreciate the love of Christ. And I really believe that. Listen, I believe that if, you could, if we could just really, if I could really truly understand what Christ had done for me, you know what? It would change me. It would change me completely. I don't think we're ever going to fully appreciate it until we get to heaven. Jesus understands us. He understands our failings. So he gave us a model to help us understand how to love one another. The model of the commandment is Jesus Christ. That ye love one another as I have loved you. When Jesus gave the command to the disciples that night, he was talking to a group of people who had lived and walked with him for the last three years, even a little bit more than three. During those three years, he had been modeling for them what it meant to love one another. This group of 12 men were a very diverse group of people. You may say, well, they were all Jews, okay? But listen to some of the differences. There was a tax collector. Nobody likes those guys. <laughs> Nobody likes tax collectors. A zealot. He was an extremist, okay? He was a terrorist of his day, okay? A fisherman, well, multiple fishermen. A loudmouth. That was Peter, if you're wondering, okay? A position seeker. We could actually count two there, John and James, right? A doubter. We all know who that is. A critic. We know who that is. A thief. And a betrayer. Really a good cross-section of humanity, isn't it? I hate to say it, but it's true. Yet Jesus loved them all, even his enemy, even his betrayer. We do not have time today but to touch the surface of what it means to love one another, but let us look at the model of Jesus' love and strive to love one another. The first one I want you to look at is sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. Look with me again at John chapter 15, starting in verse 13. John 15, in verses 13 and 14. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. I never thought about this, but I was reading someone, actually, this last week. And it, he wrote something that really struck me. Only Jesus could give his life for many. And only, G and only he could fully model sacrificial love. Now, the reason it struck me was what I'm going to tell you next. Some may give their life for another, when all is lost and there is no other escape. You know, we often talk about, you know, military heroes or people who, you know, sacrifice it. And I'm not trying to take away from that. But have you ever thought about it for a minute? In most cases, they what? They gave their life at the, at the extremity. In other words, there was no hope. And through their sacrifice, they made hope. But Jesus gave up his life willingly and actively 
to save all Adam's lost seed, even when he could have walked away at any point. Nobody could touch God. Nobody could have said, oh, you can't, you know. I mean, he could have, he could have, he could have literally been put on the cross and literally just got off the cross. There was nothing keeping him there. No human thing, no humanity, no nails, no anything could have kept Jesus Christ on the cross. I think it was last week we talked about, he said, I am, and they all fell down. That's the power that he had. His love is truly without parallel in human history. It is truly sacrificial. The application is clear that to love one another, we must be willing to sacrifice our own lives and wants for the brethren. I want you to think about what I've already said. I wonder how many churches have been destroyed for the lack of this key aspect of loving one another. How many times have churches been damaged, bodies of believers been destroyed because the believers weren't willing to sacrificially love each other, to set aside their wants and their desires? You know what would be, if you think about it, it's kind of strange, but if everybody set aside what they wanted, you know what would happen? Everybody would have what was best. You ever thought about that? Sacrificial love. If we're going to love the brethren, this is the kind of love we need to have. Number two, the love of a friend. Christ modeled sacrificial love, but he also modeled the love of a friend. Going back to John chapter 15, let us read the next verse. Verse 15. In verse 15 it says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Jesus literally says, I'm your friend. You're my friend. Most of our friends will be our equals or people of common interest. Jesus, however, sets a higher bar for friendship. Jesus' relationship with the men he called his friends was based not on equality, in position, or ability. He was God, the all-powerful creator. They weren't even in the ballpark, okay? They were just common, sinful men. Instead, his declaration of friendship was based upon Jesus' love and their faith in God. He brought them into his circle of friends and like a friend, shared with them his knowledge and his position. There should be no big people in the church of the living God. There is only one person who is worthy of our praise. There is only one head of the church that is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Let us learn to value and care about each other as friends. It starts by humbly gathering at the feet of our friend and Savior, Jesus. There is only room for friends at Jesus' feet. The Quakers used to, and I'm not, I'm not advocating becoming a Quaker, but they used to use that as a term that they used for those who gathered together, was friend. I think it's a good, very biblical-based term. So much damage is done in the church by squabbling and fighting amongst each other. Friends care about each other in spite of all their weaknesses and all their differences. So we see the love of a friend. We see the sacrificial love. And then the final one I'm going to talk about today is the love of a servant. Now that may seem kind of strange. I just got done telling you we weren't servants, but friends. But the love of a servant. Turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we're going to go back. And we're going to look at John chapter 13, verse 12 through 15. 
We'll read that. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? This is after he washed their feet. He, ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, there's nothing wrong with, you know, some churches do foot washing, and as long as they don't make more out of it than it is, it's fine. The Bible, Jesus was not telling us that we should every service wash each other's feet. And just to be honest with you, I probably prefer not to wash your feet. <laughs> and you'd probably prefer not to wash mine, okay? Keep our socks and shoes on and be happy, right? But the event here that is mentioned here took place shortly before Jesus gives them the new commandment. The Bible tells us that Jesus took upon him the form of a servant. When he washed the disciples' feet, he demonstrated the love of a servant. Now think about this for a second. How does a servant demonstrate love? A servant demonstrates love when he willingly does service for another that he is not obligated to do. Jesus, the Son of God, was in no way obligated to wash the feet of his creation. Yet in love, he set an example of loving one another. When we love one another, we willingly serve one another. Jesus is our perfect model of loving one another. He not only showed sacrificial love, the love of a friend, and the love of a servant, but also the example of patience, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, and so much more that we don't have time to mention today. So we see the model of the commandment. We saw the new of the commandment. And the last thing we want to look at is the testimony of the commandment. We have now considered all these other things, but we need to look at this last item, the testimony of the commandment. And I want you to turn back to John chapter 13 and look at verse 35. John chapter 13, verse 35 says this, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye, lo ye have love one to another. Jesus tells us that one of the distinguishing characteristics of a believer is that they love one another. This is not a hidden feature or something that must be dug out. It should be obvious to all that come into our assembly. In 1 John chapter 3, John tells us that the absence of love for each other is a sign that we are not the children of God. That's pretty hard. Read with me together if you'll turn to 1 John chapter 3, verses. we're going to start in verse 10. This is the same author that wrote the book of John. He says in John chapter 3, verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And it's talking about other believers. For this is the message that we, ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and therefore, and therefore, wherefore he slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life according, I mean, eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, 
because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's world's goods and seeth his brother hath need have need <clears throat> and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him how dwelleth the love of god in him my little children let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and truth and in truth I'm missing my words here this morning the greatest thing that can ever be said of a group of believers is that they love one another. The message this morning is not a message of correction, but rather a message of encouragement to our church to let brotherly love continue. That's found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. In the world, hate grows stronger and stronger, and every day is every day just seems to get worse, just as Jesus warned us. In Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 10, it says this, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We need more and more today to be kindly, affectionate, one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 10. This message is the help that I need to go another day. It is easy to become cold and callous in the darkness of the world that we live in. Instead of being the light in the darkness that God has called us to be. Let our love increase for one another that all the world may know there is still a God who can change and make an old sinner like you and me different. The only Father, Lord, we do thank you for this opportunity to study your word, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, you'd increase our love here in the church, Lord. I pray that you would Lord, I'm so thankful for the people we have, Lord, and I thank you for their love for each other and the way they express it. But Lord, I pray that you would help us not to be satisfied with just where we are today in our Christian walk. Lord, I pray that we would increase our love one for another. Lord, as the world gets darker, let us be brighter. Lord, that people may see the difference. Lord, that we may be able to share the love that you've given us with others, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would just be with those that aren't able to be here today. Lord, I pray that you'd protect them and keep them safe in their journeys and where they're at in different places of the world. Lord, I thank you for all you're doing in our midst, Lord. And Lord, I pray that your name would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.